online. Yeah, definitely not on my end. And Spencer and Richard, you don't see it either? Nope. Okay. You there guys you broke it. Yeah. It's gone live now. <laughs> gone live now. And Spencer and Richard, you don't see it either? Nope. Okay. Me, uh... It's all right. This is okay. We're good. We're, we're live. We are live. Let's see. Round three. Hello, world. Can you hear me? I, I actually have. have. I'm actually pretty proud of myself. Uh, this is only the first time we had technical difficulties. I'm sure someone in chat will call out my. Are we still live yesterday afternoon? But let's not dwell. Let's not dwell. So let me just mute everything. Okay. Cool. So, Ethan, thank you for letting us know you can hear us. Hey, Brad, how's it going? Everybody, this is round three, and we're basically back again, day four for Fusion 360 Design and Manufacturing Workshop. And essentially, today, we have got some heavy hitters on the call. We have one more person joining us, Marty. She'll be here in a couple minutes. So what I'm going to do is basically give a little bit of context and, and catch up for those of you who may be new to the, to the stream this week. Um, you know, we started Monday with a very basic jigs and fixtures using joints, assemblies, and, and a little bit of, of parameters and how you can use that to actually um, you know, ship a product or create a product for the first time. And it seemed to be really helpful. We got a lot of great questions. We got a lot of great um, engagement. So we were really happy to see that. Day two, Brad and myself and Jonathan were back on the call and we did a deep dive into parameters for production and how to use parameters to actually scale a business uh, and to accommodate clients' requests for design changes. Day three was yesterday when that was uh, uh, the sculpt environment, which I think was a little eye-opening for a lot of participants. Uh, the sculpt environment is, is very powerful for the industrial design workflow, but you know, admittedly, it can be a little bit of a, a new mindset or mentality or, or workflow approach to doing it. So hopefully you pulled some stuff out of there. Now, I've kind of been leading up to this all week about this might be my favorite day because... This is where we start to really synthesize how to take ideation or your idea to completion, right? How do you actually ship a product and the manufacturer of your, of your designs? And the answer to that is it's very complex. But what I thought we'd do today is focus on a couple workflows that are super relevant to the furniture design industry and the furniture manufacturing industry and, and how they're at times a little hidden or they're just better kind of approaches to deal with end grain, tear out, cross grain cutting, nest, nesting or fabrication, which if you remember on, on Brad's call, we showed a little bit of a range that the, the, the question was, is there a way to use it kind of in the free version? And, um, and then custom tools, custom tool creation. And, and specifically for shapers or molders or or anything like that, where you actually have to send out drawings to get a custom tool made, we're gonna show you how to make those in Fusion 360, how you can put them in your tool library and, and actually recall them every time when you're, when you're taking things to market or taking things to production. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. And uh, for, for those of you who are first on the call, first time, my name's Trent. My background is in furniture manufacturing and design. And I've been making furniture at scale in production for about 15 years. Um, I have a, uh, I've been playing with advanced manufacturing for a long time uh, in the wood and composites industry, and am excited to actually get to synthesize a lot of this stuff. So today, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is we're actually going to show you how to manufacture this, and and Richard's going to walk through some really good workflows to actually. Um, you know, assess what tool paths are best for you, what type of considerations to, to deal with in speeds and feeds. And then uh, we're going to actually just kind of show you what it would be like to use, uh, you know, air vacuum, like a, a, a vacuum puck system or, or things like that. We're also going to show you a little bit, let me reshare a different screen now. When we get into doing custom tool paths, you'll remember Brad showed this data set on uh, Tuesday, and I was telling you that we're going to learn how to make custom tools that can actually do this profile in one go, which is immensely 
powerful, especially if you're running machines like BS or anything with aggregate heads or multi-axis things. But even if you're doing three axis stuff or two and a half axis stuff, you know, the, the workflow that Richard will show today could be used on a three axis mill or it could be used on a five axis mill. It really doesn't matter. So before we jump into all of that, I want to do get a little quick introduction of, of who's on the call. So Richard, why don't you kick us off? Give us a little bit about who you are, what you do and, and where you're coming from. Yeah, hey Trent, thanks very much for that. So, hi everyone out there. Um, there are a few people that I can see that normally join me and Spence on our on our Thursday live stream. So I'm not new to everyone, but for those of you that haven't met or seen me before, my name is Richard Stubley. I'm one of the process specialists at the Birmingham Tech Center. So um, I'm not. That's a green screen behind me. It's not actually the machine, unfortunately. Uh, they don't let me in the office this late, so I'd definitely be uh, definitely there if I was allowed to be. Um, but yeah, so manufacturing is sort of in the blood. Father was a manufacturing engineer. Grandfather was. I had bedtime stories about lathes and milling machines, not princesses and dragons. So anyway, yeah, I've been in manufacturing now for about eight years. Um, used to be a customer of Autodesk and then had the opportunity to come and work for Autodesk and haven't looked back since. Their time, build AC Cobras, who else doesn't do that? So yeah, love engineering, love building anything, um, and love talking to you guys. I'll try and not take over my allotted time because I can talk until I normally get muted. So I'll pass on to someone else. Go on, Spence, I'll pass on to you. I'll pass the, the puck over. Cheers, Rich. Hi, everybody. Like, like he says, uh, it's good to see some familiar faces on, on the live stream for sure. Um, for those that don't know me, Spencer Hardcastle, I work in customer engagement and head up a, a small customer advocacy team looking at uh, customer success gaps and, and trying to fill those gaps with, with changes to software or, or video tutorials and those types of things. Uh, my background is I did uh, automotive engineering and uh, I did five years looking into how cars work and then never wanted to, to do anything like that ever again. And, and now I work at Autodesk and have done for the past uh, seven years. Through, came to Autodesk actually through the acquisition of the, the uh, Dell Camp portfolio and uh, never looked back. And now I'm on the live stream with these beautiful people. So I guess with that, I can pass to one of those beautiful people, Angelo. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer. Thank you for the intro. Yeah, so my name is Angelo Juris. I'm on the customer success team here at Autodesk. Before Autodesk, I worked at Tesla in the R&D prototype lab for Mr. Elon Musk. I uh, had a good time there, but now I'm having a lot of fun here at Autodesk working with these fine people and showing people how to use Fusion. My background is machining, so metalworking. So on the furniture design stuff, uh, uh, these guys are a lot smarter than me. I'm here to just support and answer any toolpath questions, things of that nature. And Brad and I, we do a live stream every Thursday. So I'm happy to be here, see some familiar names as well. And with that, I'll pass it off to the smart one of the bunch here, Marty. Oh dear. <laughs> Hello, I'm Marty. I'm on the Fusion 360 technical marketing team um, covering manufacturing. So you might've heard my voice on some YouTube videos um, before. I am a mechanical engineer by trade is probably wrong by education, I guess. Um, and then I got into machining while I was in school, working in the machine shop there, um, got introduced to Autodesk as an intern and then just kind of kept going and learned similar to Angelo, mostly metal work. Um, any woodworking I've done is typically through my dad and with hand tools. So it's fun to learn more about kind of the, the pr high production nature of, of furniture design. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. That's good. And, and thanks for everybody. It looks like Spencer might have had some technical difficulties. He'll be back on, but but we've got plenty of firepower on this call today. So real quick, I, I want to call out why we're talking about the high production manufacturing of furniture. If you're a business at scale, you know that sometimes you might be making one or 100. If you're big enough, maybe you're making a thousand. And the whole idea there is to gain these moments of efficiency that truly impact your bottom line, right? Like a penny saved is an hour earned is like, you can save money by getting that time back. Um, you know, I had this really interesting quick chat with actually someone on the call today. I hope he, hope he doesn't mind me calling it out. Uh, uh, one of the participants, Greg Cox, 
you know, he was telling me about this workflow that uh, an old business had, and, and it was very much similar to a lot of businesses these days, right? Where you're essentially working in, in one program, say Inventor, and then you export a step file, and then you throw it over to your BS or whatever machine you're using in their operation system. And, or maybe you take it into AutoCAD and do some DX, DXF stuff. The power here is that we can do all of those things in a single platform which is truly bar none. I mean, I've been in a lot of different manufacturing spaces and a lot of different tools. And I've, there's a reason I've chosen to build a business off of Fusion 360. Um, so without that, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to Richard and he's gonna go through his set. Again, please engage in the chat. Like we've got a ton of people on here that I literally think if we wanted to, this group of folks could make anything that ever was thought of. So. So throw the questions out there. Let's have a good chat. And I'm excited to see what Richard shares. So take it off. Cheers, Trent. Thanks for handing that over. So hopefully you all recognize this part from the, the um, live streams all this week. All I've done is just put it on some, some vacuum pucks. Um, I like to really use the power of fusion for the modeling. So I've just put the, the tubes in there. That might not be how the machine, but it's just to show that the more things you can put in, the less mistakes that can happen. So putting things like the tubing in, you know, you can suddenly see if a toolpath is going to fly through the tubes. You know, it's going to save you a lot of time and, and, and problems. So real quick example, just if it's on there on your bed, I would try and model it up. It might save some problems later on. So we can see we've got this real nice molding um, with this sort of unique curved form on there. Yeah, you could probably do that with about five or six different tools you could come in with you know, a cut to do these undercuts and then, yeah, you, you, I'm sure you could find a way of doing it, but it's not really the way you want to do it. You want to get a specifically designed form mill that you've had made to do that um, geometry. So what we need to do is we need to effectively draw a sketch of the tool, and then we're going to make that into a tool to use in manufacturing. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to use the part itself to drive that form. It's already been modeled. Let's reuse it. So I'm going to try and find a place I can sort of cross section this. Um, there's a few places I could do it. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go for an offset plane. I'm going to choose that face and I'm just going to drag it back. So I've now got a nice plane that sits over there. Let's turn that plane on. I've probably got my construction off by default here. So let's just turn that plane on and then we can start to model on there. So let's create the sketch on that plane. And now we can see I've got that cross section there. I could slice it if I really wanted to, um, and I could see where I am. But because it's just a 2D profile looking straight down the part, it gives me quite a nice view of what's happening. So the first thing I want to do now is I want to project the geometry. So I'm going to project over here. Um, and I want to project the whole body. But I want to project that body. Hit OK. So that's now giving me this real nice line of the geometry on our part. But that's not my tool. That's some of the tool. So I'm just going to quickly just go around and sketch out what my tool looks like and we'll dimension it afterwards. I'm one of those annoying people that likes to uh, sketch everything out freehand and then dimension it. I know everyone's got their own way of doing it. So now I actually need to think about how I'm going to how I'm going to buy this tool and what I'm going to draw the specifications. You know, really bad practice for it to end there because we all know we're going to get things push underneath. We're not going to do a clean cut. So I want my tool to extend a little bit down below that surface. Um, and I'm going to go down, let's go down 0.4. That's fine. Now let's do exactly the same on that. I want a nice symmetrical tool. Um, everything in the world is better being symmetrical other than your face because that would look a bit odd if it was. Um, and then it's going to be, let's go for a two inch cutter. So it's one inch on there. I hope you all realize the fact that I'm working in inches here is quite some feat. Um, it's going to be a one inch shank. So let's go half an inch on there and let's go four inches out the spindle. So four inches on there. So we can see I've got one dimension that's still unconstrained and I'm not sure what it is. Let's drag it and let's have a quick look and see what we've got. Oh, there we go. So we can see there that's not a 40, a nice degree angle. So let's pop a perpendicular in there. Whole sketch has gone um, black rather than blue. It means it's all fully constrained for me. Let's finish off that sketch. So brilliant. I've now got 
effectively what my tool is going to look like on our machine. So let's hop over into the manufacturing workspace and see what happens next. I'm going to go to my manage and go form mill. So we go for my form mill. I'm going to select my tool profile. You can see there it's grabbing that geometry. And that's, that's what I want to make sure. You've got to be careful here. If you've done some sort of weird sketching with construction lines or not done it properly, you might not get that. So just make sure that highlight is exactly what you want to be spun. Think when this tool's in the machine spindle, it's going to be spinning around. So that's why we're going to do a spun profile type of act here. Choose an axis. That's the axis of rotation there. And it's guessed it right. So that was because I drew the line from top to bottom. If I'd actually drawn the line from bottom to top, it would have grabbed that vector and it would have been the wrong one. But I've just got this little handy flip axis tool here. So think about it. Think which way the tool's pointing out your spindle, the, the, the tool axis. Now, the next one that's quite important, this is compensation point. What this means is when I come to drive this tool, at whip uh, what bit of the tool do I want to match up with my contour selection? So, of course, you don't want to set the bottom there because the geometry doesn't exist there. What I'm going to select is any sort of any one of these sort of lips. I'm going to go for that one there, that first one. And what happens then is when I come to select my 2D contour to go round, I'm going to select that bit of the contour. So let's hit OK. And nothing's happened, we think. What we've got to do now, we've got to hop over into our tool library and we can see now this form mill has appeared. I should have like done the magician's thing and shown you there was nothing there before because you've got to believe me now um, that it wasn't there before, but trust me, it wasn't. So let's edit this tool. Let's give it a good description. So this is going to be our form tool. I mean, I come up with some very inventive names here. Um, and we can look at our cutter and these don't really make much sense because we've driven this all from our sketch. The important thing is now our cutting data. Um, I know nothing about machining wood. So Trent's told me um, 18,000 RPM would be a good one here. Um, we're going to go ramp spindle speed. I'm going to go 18,000 in there again because we're not going to be ramping with this tool. Now cutting feed rate again. I am English. I work in metric. Trent's told me 20 inches per minute. Really cool tip here for you all. Even though this document that I'm working on is um, doing a tool in metric, if I put in 200 IN per min and hit enter, so that was a, a imperial input and it's converted to metric for me. So if you've got sort of contradicting data from different suppliers, doesn't matter if you're in an inch document, just write in mm per min, you can do the same round. So really nice, works out quite well. Let's just put that ramp feed rate um, at the same as well, 50, 80, and just put the plunge in the same. I don't like any of these uh, orange warnings. They're all gone now. So let's accept that. So I've got my tool, sort of what happens next? Let's go for a 2D contour. So 2D contour is nice, gives us lots of control over this tool path. So I'm selecting the tool, there we go. And now I'm going to select my geometry. So Fusion naturally tries to do a closed um, loop contour because that is what you most likely need to do a lot of the time. Think about like pocketing, doing sides, it's a closed loop contour. Um, you can do an open contour and there's a top tip here. Hold down the Alt key, so that's A-L-T if you can't understand my accent. And that's gonna now, only pick an open contour and it makes now chaining this so much easier. So I'm going to click on that contour again and now I can bring that round to my full geometry. So again, starting it off as an open contour just really makes things a lot easier. Now make sure you hit the accept and then we're going to go for OK on there. What we can see, we've now got our toolpath on our part. So let's do a little simulation of this and see what we look like. So what we can see now, we're going into our stock nice and slowly going in. And there we go. We're machining out our beautiful molding all in one go with a form tool. So anyone out there before be really interested to hear in the chat. Do you use form tools? Have you had trouble with them before? 
be interesting to know if you now got some new ideas about how you can you know really utilize those form tools from within inside of fusion so one thing i would want to say as well is although the compensation point we chose as that bit there on the machine you still put the very bottom as your tool length that's so you don't set that little lip as the, the z zero point it's the bottom of the tool that was chosen so we knew in fusion where to sort of match the two up that was really important so there we go from there that's all brilliant let's now look at our other examples that was form tools please let me know everyone else is working on the chat doing a really good job let us know what you think about form tools and we'll dive into the next example so again hopefully this one looks a bit familiar as well this is the um the arms that, that's the word i'm looking for the side arms of the chair um and i have modeled up the stock of how this would be made so you've got to think now we've got the grain of the wood's quite important we're looking at here we, we keep looking at that the whole time so the grain of the wood's going to be long across the length of the wood as it is normally um but this has allowed me to do two things. One, makes the manufacturing environment really interactive because it knows exactly where the material is and most importantly, where it's not. So we don't waste time machining it. But also, if I just show you what I've done here, I've done a split command and I've split the body. If I turn off my stock, I've actually split the body into what actually are the natural segments that will be glued and jointed together. And this is going to be really important later. So bear that in mind. Keep watching. And I'll show you why I did that extra step. So you can see now there are four bodies for the different bits of wood that have all been glued together. But then most importantly, they're actually showing the right grain direction we've got in them now. So if we hop over into the manufacturing space, you can see, look how good that is. My stock, let's show, let's show you how I did set up actually. In my setup, my body was those four bodies that we see there. And then in my stock, I went from solid and selected those four solid blocks, which means I get a really nice view now. This is exactly what I've got on my, sheet, my machine. Again, Fusion, integrated CAD CAM, do as much as you can together. Really try and replicate what you've got on the machine and then what you've got in the software. It's gonna make your lives so much easier. So, I bet there are some people out there that are the king and queens of parallel. All you do is just parallel over your part all day long and think this is amazing. And then you spend the rest of your life sanding. Um, there are some good reasons why you have to spend the rest of your life sanding. And that's because parallel is a toolpath that's driven by step over. So if we look at the part here, we can see that all these step overs are really nice and even. However, if I turn around, look at this step down here. So we've got this massive step down. What that's probably 20 millimeters or nearly an inch for, uh, for those um, metrically challenged among us. So what we've got here now is a massive step down, um, but a consistent step over. And that's because it's just the way the toolpath is going to be designed to work. And another one is we're going to get really, you know, imagine here we're going along the grain and here we're going against the grain. So we have lots of problems there, the way we go. So what can we do to sort of go around this? We've got loads of toolpaths in Fusion. The one I want to speak about is steep and shallow because it just shows this off the best, but you can do this with a combination of scallop and contour if you wanted to. But what we've got now is we're going to scallop out, or scallop, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that one. We're going to scallop out all of the shallow areas, so sort of the really flat areas, because that's a toolpath driven by step over. And then we're going to do a contour on the steep areas where it should be driven by step down. But what we also see here is actually because our wood is naturally along the grain, we have very little cross grain cutting. There's of course going to be a little bit with the way we go, but it's going to be massively reduced. And we can actually reduce it even further still. So these areas here at the end are going to be the end grain of that wood that I showed earlier. And that's why I split that body to actually get different surfaces here. So in my steep and shallow, what I can actually do is I can go in and in my geometry, I can select those four bits of end grain and I can make them avoid surfaces. So now you see this steep and shallow path 
actually is not touching the end grain areas. But no, we still want to machine them. We're just going to go through it a little bit slower. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to duplicate that toolpath, Control D, and show you how easy this is now. Let's edit that. Let's just whack our feed rate in half, 500 millimeters a minute. Let's go into our geometry. And I'm just going to invert them now to touch surfaces. So rather than avoiding them, we're just going to touch them instead. Let's drop that down ever so much just to make this calculate a little bit quicker for us. What we're going to see now, we're going to see that toolpath calculate. And now we're only going to machine those end grain bits that bit slower. So of course, the trouble with end grain is it's all coming out at you. There's no good way of machining it. You just got to go through it slightly different, a bit slower, a bit more caring, um, not to get any tear out on those areas. So we've just halved the feed rate. I'm just guessing it's half, but you know, you guys are going to know exactly what feed rates you want to use. And what we can see now, the combination of those two toolpaths is going to properly machine our part all over, consistent step overs, consistent step downs, and you're not going to spend the rest of your lives having to sand your components. You want that component to come off that machine tool and be nearly ready to ship or ready to ship if you can. So I know that's been an absolutely whistle stop tour on some of those toolpaths. Um, I'm going to be sat in the chat now while Spencer's doing his amazing demo on nesting. Um, if you want to hear anything else, hit us up in the chat. We'll do what we can and we can always do more live streams. So ask what you want and we shall give. Perfect, Spence. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I get those really tough questions in the chat. Rich likes them when the questions are really hard to answer. Great. So hopefully, let me wait a little bit for the delay, but hopefully people will be able to see the screen. And what you're seeing is the expanded view of, of that component Rich made. So if you look at the top there, that should obviously look very familiar. Uh, and this is the overall assembly. And, and what I'm going to talk about today is uh, nesting and the ability to, to run production runs on, on the remainder of these parts, right? Not necessarily the parts that have the, the form tools or, or the more the specialist parts, but really the, the remainder of this uh, assembly. Um, con control quantities, control machining paths, and, and, and so on and so on. And really the nesting workflow in, in Fusion starts with the design. So I'm over here in the design um, and the first thing we want to decide is, well, which of these parts do I actually want to nest? Because obviously there's some like stock parts, like for like the, the, the hinges, the handles, the latches and so on. If I open some of these up, I mean, we don't want to nest the wine balls as an example, right? So how do we control that? Well, to do that, you want to navigate over into that tools tab. And the second icon here, this nest preparation. So this is actually going to allow us to specify which of the uh, which of the components uh, involved within the design I actually want to pass the nest in. And that's my first top tip is that nesting only works with the components and it only works with single body components, right? And so if you have a component that's got four bodies in it, you're going to have to choose which of those bodies you pass through or split them up into components. So um, that'd be my first tip straight off the bat. Second thing I'd say is that we can accept a variety of different component types. So if you have a combination of maybe sheet metal and wood, then that's absolutely fine. What an SN will do is it's just going to split them up um, onto different studies into different sheets and allow you to program them in, in slightly different ways. So I've gone through this list. And as you can see, I'm ignoring quite a lot of these components, right? Um, but the ones that uh, I am passing through, we have some controls over things like, well, it will automatically determine the thickness based on the design, right? But you can override that thickness. So you can now go into a little bit more detail of how I'm actually passing that information through. Um, we can nest sketches. We can nest solid components. Uh, if I just open that drop down there, we can nest uh, sheet metal components, or we can simply just choose to ignore something. The beauty about this dialogue and this nest prep dialogue is actually saved with the document, right? So when if I decide to use this document later on, pull it into maybe another design, I don't have to redo all of this. So it saves with it. 
all of my nest preparation is a one hit wonder. You come in here, you set it up, it's done. So once I'm happy with my design side and I've actually chosen, you know, which of the components I want to pass the nest in, I'm, I'm ready to start moving over into manufacture. So I'll go ahead and just switch that workspace up using that switch there, top left-hand corner. And now we can get into the, into the details and into the bones of it. One thing I will say just before I start is the, the physical material that you set in design will be used to separate all of the components once you nest them together. So, so long as you got your physical material set properly, everything, everything uh, will, will separate itself perfectly. And so I'm in the fabrication tab here. So that's where you want to go to, to access all your nesting capabilities. And there's really just three dialogues. Um, so it's nice and easy to, uh, to work through, right? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is your material library. So I already said that you set your material in the design workspace and that's 100% true. But now what we've got to do is we've got to take those materials and we've got to say, well, what do the sheets look like in which I'm nesting them onto, right? What are the, the default nesting parameters? What are the default packaging sizes? Uh, and, and we're just gonna talk through this particular dialogue real quick. So as you can see, it's automatically generated for me three different materials. They're all the same material, but they're all different thicknesses, right? And that's the material is the material name and the thickness, and that's it. The packaging is going to be the dimensions of the sheet, right? So if I move over into that packaging tab, you can see that the sheet here is, is 96 by 48 inches, and we've associated a cost to that particular sheet and the cost is important as well as the packaging sizes this is the area in which you're going to set some defaults so do do i want to allow 90 degree 180 270 degree rotations in what increment do i want those rotations to be calculated in the finer your increments the longer it takes to calculate what's going to be the frame width so how much material is going to be left around the edge of my sheet Item separation is going to be the, uh, the distance between each component that I'm nesting together. And all of this information is stored um, so that you can use it time and time and time again. So again, much like the nest preparation, the process material library is kind of a one hit wonder. You're going to set this up at the start so that you never really have to come in here again, unless you get some you know, one off materials or maybe a different size sheets. Um, as, as a couple of examples. So once I've set up my materials, uh, the next thing we need to look at is actually the, um, the component sources. And that's what we call it. So the component sources is really going to be a list of everything that I've designated to be nest friendly, for want of a better term. But it's going to get rid of all of those components I chose to ignore over in the design workspace. And this is just going to be a list of all the components I want to nest. And so what this dialog allows us to do is a couple of things. So it allows you to visualize each component individually. So as you can see, as I'm clicking through the list, that image there in the bottom right corner is updating. It shows me how many of those components we used within the assembly. And it also allows me to overwrite that quantity if I wanted to. I can overwrite the material. So let's say I've brought in a load of maybe uh, flat patterns uh, or, or drawings. I've extruded them all. Um, and for whatever reason, I've extruded one to a different height. And I actually just want to override it. So you can do that, override it, choose a different option in that drop down, and then your nests will, will on the, the components will all nest together. Now, these are going to look familiar. We, we just looked at all these, right? We just looked at rotate by 90, the deviation, the increment. And that's true. So you can imagine it as the defaults of those settings are saved with the material. So the material is like number one. Then underneath that, you can actually override those settings on a component by component basis if you wanted to. So typically, I might you know, have some settings for the half inch ash. But for this particular component, I actually want to not allow 90 degree rotations for whatever reason. So I can come in there and unbind it from the material uh, 
and change my rotate 90 as an example. So once I'm happy with all of my components, I can then go ahead and start with the what we're all here to see, I guess, and that's actually the creation of the nest study. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we use this second icon here, the create nest study, I'm just going to, going to, going to go ahead and make 10 of these. Uh, so the study tab is, is your quantities, really. The shapes tab is going to be the list of shapes. Packaging is going to be the packaging options that you've already specified. Global parameters is settings. And away we go. So I can go ahead and click OK. The first thing you'll see is we've got a nest study over here in our tree. Then we've got three nests. And those nests represent one for each of my material and material thicknesses that I had in my process library and in the, the current design. And there we go. So there's our first sheet. So it spits out uh, one sheet for each, um, well, as many sheets as you need in that particular nest. And like I said, we've got three nests. So we've got the, the three quarter inch ash, the half inch ash and the quarter inch ash. I can now analyze these so I can go ahead and select them, activate them, compare them, contrast them, you know, observe like that sheet isn't very full. I'm not being very efficient with that sheet. So maybe I want to pull in some external components to increase the sheet efficiency there. A couple of things I'll point out straight off the bat. Um, Rich demonstrated how you can um, create setups using uh, solid representations for stock. And so automatically we're pulling that solid uh, stock representation in here through the nested engine. So when you go ahead and create your setups and your subsequent machining operations, you can go ahead and use that, that solid there uh, and get an, a very, very accurate machine simulation. The next thing I'll point out, you see this little blue line? That's what we're calling the remnant cut. So when you're not very efficient with your sheets or whether, you know, in this case, we've only got four components to nest. So, it, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to be very efficient. You want to have square edged remnants, right? You don't want to all jiggly jaggly. <laughs> I probably use a more professional word than jiggly jaggly, but there you go. I'm running with it. You want it nice and square, right? And so that's where that remnant cut is. You can just create something like a, if you're using a laser, you could create a laser path on there. If you're using a router, then you can obviously create um, a 2D contour type toolpath on there and away you go. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, there's, I've got another model here I'll show you, right? So if I just quickly jump over into this one, this is the, the sideboard that, was uh, and has been used in, in the previous live, live streams this week. If I then jump over into the manufacturer, as if by magic, you'll see that we've already got some nests calculated. And the reason why I did this uh, is to show you the power of creating multiple nest studies. So in this first nest study, we're actually um, doing that wine cabinet we just did, right? So these sheets are going to look very, very familiar. In fact, this is the other one. This is the, the cabinet, the, the, the sideboard. Nest study 10. Now, this is going to be the, um, the wine cabinet, right? And then nest study 11 is actually a combination of both. And the reason why I did that is if we go ahead quickly and just do select them all and do a quick compare, wait for that dialog to pop up. There we go. So remember, right back in the beginning of the demo, I associated a cost to each sheet. And I did that because now that I'm using this compare dialog, I can actually compare the costs and the cost differences of doing 10 of each separately and then 10 combined together. Right. So this top study is going to be 10 of the cabinet, and that's going to cost us just over $2,000 to make 10 of them. And that's according to the cost that I put in my process material library. This bottom one here is gonna be 10 of those wine cabinets that we talked about right at the beginning of the demo. That's gonna be just over three and a half. This middle one here is actually 10 of each. And you can see that this is considerably cheaper than actually doing these separately. And that's because we've 
allowed to be more efficient by combine, combining the two nest studies together. And this compare dialog is really useful, right? So I can come in here the study, I can look at it from a nest perspective instead of a sheet. Remember, a nest is a material and thickness. So it's actually going to say how efficient I am with each individual nest. It's going to say how long it took. It's going to say the number of sheets I've used of that particular material, um, the cost, of course, and then the, the area of that, of that particular uh, material I'm using. I can go even granular than that. I can go down to the sheet level. So I can actually compare in this dialogue, and I can take a slightly different view, every single sheet I've created across all three of those studies. I've got an efficiency. So I can choose which ones I'm actually sending and which ones I want to maybe apply some filler parts to, add a couple of parts in there to increase that efficiency. And that's really nesting in, in a nutshell. That's, uh, that's the entire workflow. Um, so just to recap real quick. So everything starts with the design. Got to make sure that you're starting as you mean to go on by selecting the components that you want to uh, take forward through, through the nesting workflow. You set up your materials in manufacturing. So your sheet sizes, your costs, your nesting defaults. You're then going to go into component sources and aggregate them together, customize them on a component by component basis, and then create your nests. Um, it pulls all that information together. It automatically separates it on a material by material basis and allows you to then go ahead and, and, and start the manufacturing process and creating tool paths. So I guess with that, I can hand back, hand back to the guys and uh, take any questions. Awesome. Yeah. Why don't you uh, go ahead and quit sharing? And then if anybody has something they want to share, I know Richard had a couple of questions he wanted to field live. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, it's been really important to us that we show everyone tools and tips and tricks that are available in regardless of, of whether you're, you're paying for a, an extension or not. The nesting and fabrication is an extension. And the whole entire reason that we built extensions is because it doesn't make sense to charge you all, you know, X amount of dollars and give you a bunch of functionality that you're never going to use, right? And so the extension is really good because if you are, if you do have a gantry mill and you're running through a ton of cabinets, this is one of those things that you buy the extension for a reasonable price. And then all of a sudden you're, you're actually outputting twice or three times or four times as much as you were before. For if you're someone who's just starting out and not a business owner and not needing to do high volume, the arrange command, which you can see in the second series that was on Tuesday, that's free. That's in your base subscription. You can use it. You're still going to get a whole lot of really good functionality from it in regards to kind of putting things on a plane and optimizing them for, for camming your stuff. Um, but you're not going to get the cost you know, analysis. You're not going to get multiple studies. You're not going to get optimized like you know, you're not going to be able to do like the Russian doll thing where you can get like inside, 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 inside kind of things. So it really is a choose your own adventure. And, and also we're, we built it so you can tailor it to your business. Um, so that, that's really important that I want to, uh, to call out. Um, so there's a couple of questions. I think Richard, why don't you go ahead and field the question you had pointed out live, keep the questions coming. Uh, there's a couple of questions about edge banding panels and things like that. I'll sort through and see if I can field any more or maybe get one of these other panelists to field it too. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much. Trent. So um, this was a, a smoothing question. So I'm going to try and not go too deep on this, but uh, we'll still give a good overview. So the thing we've got to think about before we even start is CNC machines and NC code and how does it work? So little mini uh, NC code for everyone. So you've got G1, straight line move with the feed g2 a perfect arc clockwise g3 a perfect arc counterclockwise and in short that's all your machine can really do it can't do a spline move and do tangents between them all it can just do straight lines and perfect arcs to the left perfect arcs to the right now that's quite difficult when we haven't got a part that's a straight line and got perfect arcs. So what we have to do is we have to look at what might be a spline infusion, 
and we have to split that down into loads of straight lines and then we have to machine from there so with smoothing off i think that's really useful i don't have it on all the time because it gets quite distracting um is this little thing here show points and that actually shows you all those little mini straight line segments we've split that toolpath into so you can see here of course where it's doing less of a curve those straight lines are a bit further out and what we're doing there is we're basically following the tolerance that the toolpath has been applied for so we all know if we ramp up our, our tolerance in our toolpath dialog, we calculate um, over a longer period of time, it takes us longer to calculate, so we're trying to stick to the model closer. Um, so what we've got here, we can see is uneven points. You know, imagine if this was a toolpath. I mean, if you've got a microscope on it, you would actually see a little stop at every point of those points where it's just changing direction ever so slightly. You know, but the whole point is, is to make it at a point where to, to our eye and to our feel, the part is of a good quality and fine to ship out. It's one of those people say the parts are accurate. Well, it, it, anything's accurate or inaccurate, depending on how you measure it. If you look at this or if you go in the microscope, you're going to get two very different results. But what we can do is the smoothing options just to show them in steep and shallow impasses. We've got smoothing. We've got fit arcs and evenly spaced points. So the first one I've just calculated here is evenly spaced points. Now, can we instantly see the difference between the two? So many more points. That's because I've put, let's have a look at what I put on there. Was it maximum, maximum separation of a millimeter? Now, those are much bigger than, a, those are much smaller than a millimeter the gap is, but that's because it's using like the worst one to drive the others and then to make sure they are smooth together and that you're not going to get all these sudden sharp changes as you go down. And also they're going to be very common. They're not all going to be different. You get one segment that's 10 millimeters long and one segment that's 0.1 millimeters long. It's going to be very constant all the way around. Of course, this takes longer to compute and depending on the, um, processing rate of your CNC machine, it might not actually be the right solution. Because if you've got a very slow PLC scan rate on your machine that can't look ahead and process the NC code, this might make a worse finish because we've segmented it down even more. But it's definitely something to try. You can see how your machine wants to be used and go from there. So I hope that makes it sort of clear what it's doing. It's trying to smooth out all those segments so you haven't got you know, go back to that one there, having got, you know, all these points all over the place, it tries to make them uh, nice and even. And the next one is arcs. So what this one's going to try and do is rather than using millions of G1 commands, look at where can it use G2s and G3s. And it's going to try and put those on. Again, slightly different way of trying to format the NC code to work better on your machine. Um, I can't say what's going to be best for your machine because there are so, far too many parameters uh, and variables that are going to influence that answer. But we're giving you the tools here. You're going to try and see what works best for you. And then you're going to know for future reference on there. Um, we could do an hour on smoothing. And there's one of our colleagues called Craig Chester who could do a year on smoothing. So we're not going to put any of you through that. Um, but basically, it's trying to make the part fit the NC code only using straight lines and curves. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll do a bit more in the chat if people need it, but it's all about turning these lovely shapes we design into those commands that our machine tools can understand and then end up using. Awesome. Oh, that was good. Yeah, no, that's great, Richard. I think some folks on the call are probably like, say what? But that's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of this. Um, there's a couple of questions here that I'm going to kind of just like moderate to the group. Um, the first one, I, I do want to call out Alex. Um, sorry if I'm saying the last name, Kochi, Kosi. Uh, but Alex has a, has a point about, you know, in furniture production, a lot of cabinet shops are doing edge banding in panels. You know what? Those machines have their own software stacks that you can just program on machine. And, and yeah, that those are going to be the moments where you know, optimize your workflow as much as you can, but there's going to be some machines that always have their own operating procedures. Waterjet is actually like that a lot, like with Omax, 
but where we've developed stuff with Fusion, you can actually program your water jet in Fusion now. But historically, most water jet machines had their own proprietary um, you know, software or yeah, kind of do that other workflow that we were talking about earlier with the XF pass and things like that. So I don't, I don't foresee Fusion actually getting into any type of edge banding cam solutions, to be honest with you, but I'm not the cam person. You know, I don't make the rules. I could be totally surprised, but um, I think stick with what you got. And then I think, you know, I want to fill this kind of with to Marty. I know Marty's done a ton of uh, stuff with the nesting and fabrication things. Her eyes kind of lit up. Like I'm totally calling her out unscripted. Sorry about that. But, but you know, so when we were doing the nesting and, and fabrication stuff, a lot of the folks on this call will be doing nesting in like two by fours or four by fours or like basically mill grade lumber. And, you know, from your experience, that's just as simple as the, the setup sheet, right? Like actually setting up your nesting study, you can, can you change the thicknesses? Can you, you know, what's, what's the, what would be a process for that? Or would be a range be a better option for you there? Yeah, I think it totally depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're using a single thickness of thing and you just have a bunch of them, um, a range is gonna be totally fine, especially if you're cutting like a bunch of copies of the same thing. Like if you need to nest across one piece of lumber and then you're gonna cut it like eight or nine times, um, a range is awesome. A range only really needs the dimensions in X and Y and then the Z, it just like arranges all the parts, doesn't really care how tall they are. Um, nesting is going to do more filtering by material type and thickness. And like Spencer mentioned, it will pull the physical material from the model workspace. So if you wanna like separate maple and pine or something, I don't know if those are good woods, but whatever, um, you'll just set that uh, in the material of the parts, the components more specifically. But if you had like different thicknesses of sheets, that would be one way to do that. And then you can either update your, if you update the thickness of the designed part, it will make your nest out of date. When you go back into the manufacturer workspace, you can re-nest and then it'll put it on the correct thickness of sheet. It'll auto create that material for you. It's pretty smart. So it's nice. You don't have to do a ton of pre setup if you don't want. Or if you wanna be a little more streamlined, you could set up all of your stock materials first and then kind of go, go that way. Awesome. And then kind of a follow-up too, uh, if I can keep you on. So uh, Tech Maverick asked uh, about educational experience and ed educational variants for, for some of our extensions. You know, what's the latest and greatest on like a, an EDU license having access to, to nesting and fab? Is, is that on the roadmap or is it arranged their best option? A range is certainly the best option in terms of like 100%, you can definitely use it. <laughs> um, and I believe that's true. I think with education and the extensions, that's something that we talk about constantly. And, and like there's a push and pull there of wanting to give educators like all the tools that they need to get all the experience they have. And then also um, being conscientious that you know, sometimes people sign up for education licenses who maybe aren't actually in education. So I think it's a little bit of a back and forth, but um, I know we offer the machining extension at least to some universities with large contracts. So I think like definitely if you reach out to someone on the team, we can maybe look into it. Um, cool. I know that's not a great awesome. answer. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Any context helps. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to call out that Aiden uh, pointed out and, and, and couldn't be so right. And, and Greg and I actually spoke about this a little bit earlier on like a side chat around the cost or, or companies using software that's super dated. And this, this idea that, you know, technology innovates faster than we can upskill people, but also the cost of equipment is so expensive that businesses are using equipment that are 30, 40 years old. I mean, if you walk into most manufacturers in Japan and furniture, they're doing super high end stuff on machines that were made in the seventies, right? But one of the deals now that we're seeing is that because of this extension framework, you know, you can take a $30,000 piece of software and have an extension that you pay monthly for, or you pay yearly for. And I think, you know, Angelo, I would love to hear your perspective, like working at Tesla, working in the manufacturing industry, like you have, and for as long as you've had, you've probably seen that gap better than anybody, right? Like, Software is advancing way faster than we can train people, but also way faster. I mean, 
hypothetically speaking, like what do you think Tesla would have spent a month or a year on all the software that you needed to run all of those crazy services? And do you think that, you know, having that kind of floating zone or floating kind of like focus on extensions would be a value proposition to them? I mean, I have my opinions, but I'm just curious to hear what you would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've worked at many places. In addition to Tesla, I've worked at small mom and pop machine shops that have this kind of a budget. And then you go to a company like Tesla that has that kind of a budget. So there's shops like a laboratory, mom and pop shop. They have maybe one machine or that's 10 years old and the technology is older. And then the software, equally same thing. They have outdated software. Uh, but what's great about Fusion is it's always being updated. And there was a question earlier on the chat. Someone asked about power mill. Is power mill replacing uh, Fusion? And then the, someone answered saying, well, uh, Power Mill is updated uh, less frequently than Fusion because it's cloud-based. So uh, those types of things, you know, it depends on what you're doing and what the outcome is. Uh, but a company like Tesla, they're always in, in investing in the latest and greatest, and they spend a lot of money on software and equipment and cutting tools and inspection equipment, all of that. Um, and But then again, going back to the mom and pop shop that have limited budgets, they're kind of stuck with software that might be a couple years old, unless they're yeah. on the fusion. Uh, so it's it, it just depends on the industry, of course. And I come from a metalworking background. So like I said, uh, woodworking is uh, not my specialty. Maybe if I'm doing something in the backyard and it, I'm trying to build something, but it'll not come close to what, what you're doing, Trent. But uh, so hopefully that kind of answers. Or... Yeah, no, I think it's just good to give like context, right? I mean, yeah. because at the end of the day, some of these folks on this call might be working for a company like Tesla or something, but some of them in the wood industry, but some of them might be starting their own business or have aspirations to do that. And I think it's just, I think the truth is, is what's really interesting about integrating your machining or manufacturing mm -hmm. process in-house. It's actually a lot easier than you think you, th than you think it is. And it's a lot, it can be a lot cheaper than you think it is. And I think what I call out there is like Jonathan you know, Monday's call when he made his taper jig, he designed that thing over the weekend. He cut it on his little four foot by four foot Shapioko that has a DeWalt, you know, spindle on it in Fusion. And then he's he's using it Monday morning to demo it on his table saw. That it's a different scale, but it is a manufacturing process. And that's really important to remember. And I think like when you look at where you want to go or where you want to be, the tools you put in front of you are paramount to your success. But it's also obviously you have to be have that privilege to like take the leap of things like that. So um, so I think, um, oh, this is a pretty easy question uh, that we can actually hit. Richard, uh, the beaver wants to know how you broke up the sculpting chair model uh, that we did yesterday in the manufacturing on the CNC router. So that was that split body. Um, if you wanna maybe go in and just show kind of why the, and why you're getting that loaded up, I'll, I'll keep saying, I think it's super important to always remember if you're getting into manufacturing, the way that Richard approached this in modeling his stock is the workflow you want to do, especially when you start getting into controlling grain direction. If you look at companies like Makuni or you know Thomas Moser or any other kind of like or like Tom Dixon, any high end furniture manufacturer that's doing wood, when they're actually modeling their processes and the manufacturer is working to do it, they have all their stock modeled and they're making these blanks. It's like turning a bowl. Right, like you're gonna make a ball blank, which is a block. And you're gonna put it on your lathe, and you're gonna turn it down. It's the same thing digitally. Um, so it's super important to understand what's gonna happen to grain direction, tear out, um, and even getting a finished surface off the machine. At La Homa, we didn't do any finish sanding. We literally just optimized our manufacturing to where we could put a finish on it right off the machine, which all of you know that putting a finish on a piece of furniture is probably 75% of the labor. Um, at least in my opinion, it is. So Richard, go ahead and I'll, I'll be quiet and let you show how you split those bodies up. No worries, cheers Trent. So um, while Trent was uh, track chatting there, you might've just seen, I just very quickly right clicked opacity control and put some opacity on my stock so I can have it on um, and you can see what it is. So it works well for this to show you what was going on. Here are those two split bodies. I'm going to roll that timeline back one, two. And you can see now I've got one body up there. What I'm going to do is go to modify. 
split body. Body to split is going to be that one. And then the splitting tool is going to be the face of that stock. And then we're going to hit OK. And what you can see now is I've got two bodies. Let's do exactly the same. It's right click, repeat split body. Body to split is going to be that one. And then splitting tool is going to go through there. So we've now got those four bodies, that top one and those two side ones, and they're perfectly replicating eventually the, the, the finished products that come out of our stock material. And that allowed me then to select that face on there to uh, do that um, touch and avoid surfaces that I saw before. So again, hopefully this works well. Can't say again, model your stock. Doesn't take that long. I mean, if we just roll back to where we're rolling back to here, there we go. You can see, I don't know what I'm doing. And I just quickly sketched around, made them roughly parallel, and then said, oh, you know, I'm going to use 130 there, 130, 130. I mean, I'd probably actually use 130 so it's all the same wood, but just 120 fit nice. But, you know, you can see here, you can go in and you can see, because these two might only need like three inch pieces and those two might need six inch pieces. So you can really quickly sketch up and get an idea for quoting on these things as well. You can use Fusion to do all this pre-preparation work before you actually end up putting it on the machine and finding out if it's going to work. So that was all I did, split body, and it's made it into those four. So again, really nice with those bodies. And then just make sure when you go into the CAM workspace, then when you make a new setup, the model is all four of those. And then stock from solid. And let's just open that up. And you'll see then the stock will be then from here. Let's turn that on. And I've got one, two, three, four bodies from our stock. So I've now got a really nice defined setup. Again, it's as representative as I'm going to put the effort in now for that to be on the machine. Zed's pointing the wrong way, but you get the idea. It's really nice representative of what's actually going to happen on the machine. Cheers. Awesome. And uh, I think actually Marty mentioned something in her uh, chat about public preview. And and this is actually one of these like hidden treasures that a lot of people don't know about. So maybe Marty, you can open up Fusion and show folks like what public preview is and how to turn things on and how to start playing with things before it's like officially baked into the platform. Yeah, sure thing. Um, okay, I have a very nice sheet metal data set from the previous callers on open, pretended furniture. So in the preferences dialog, which you get by clicking on your little avatar in that right hand corner, at the very bottom of the window, there are preview features. Um, it's very likely that you will not see this lock. I think I have that because I am I work for Autodesk basically. Um, and I'm filtering currently by machines, but you can search, you can filter by workspaces, by uh, is it a an extension preview or not? So, We'll skip down to manufacturing. And I have a couple enabled like um, restricted for access, set of sheet configurations, but ones that are relevant to what we're talking about are like advanced arrange, for example. So I should have mentioned this before, but advanced arrange um, adds part rotation and multi sheet to the basic arrange functionality. Our current plan is to fully release this into the nesting and fabrication extension as of today, but it is free for use right now. So if you like go in and enable this preview, you can use advanced range and just kind of see what it's all about. Um, the other one I was going to mention was 2D contour face selection. So for sheet metal um, tool pathing, we have face selection where basically you can pick the face of one part in the nest and it will auto select all the contours across the rest of the sheet, which is incredible, saves a bunch of time over individually picking every contour, especially because fusion can get a little laggy and slow when you um, are picking upwards of like 30 contours or so. Um, this preview enables that for 2D contour, the milling toolpath as well. So if you're doing woodworking, routing, and have nested sheets, which I assume most people on this call, uh, the furniture are interested in that, this is gonna be a huge time saver. Um, these are preview features, so just be careful, I would say, like um, double check stuff, don't make purchasing decisions based on them. Um, but do play around with them. They're they're great. We love getting feedback. We love um, hearing from you when you use them before they're fully released. 
Awesome. Thank you. So one thing that I saw Rasmus uh, uh, mentioned is, is how to get a hold of us, right? And and I think the important thing to call out for everybody on this call is that we're all actively engaged in the forum, actively engaged in bringing live content to the to to YouTube, uh, even on Instagram and things like that. But I want to call something out is that our forum, we are super active in it. Like you will get answers from people who are either like deep, deep pros or us. And that was one thing that really made me fall in love with Fusion in the beginning was that I could actually get an answer. So one of our products has those brass standoffs. And I had a machine that was basically doing some really funky, you know, actions on one of our, our turning ops. And I just posted to the forum and I, it was funny, I forget who it was, but someone in, in the Birmingham UK office messaged me that later that day and, you know, took my cam profile, like took my cam data, looked at it, looked at the machine manufacturer, did their own level of research and then hit me up and they were like, Hey, we solved the problem. Just use a spring pass and reverse, you know, this, and we're all of a sudden it worked perfect. And I was, you know, from, total production stop to full production. And I think it was like three hours, which I mean, come on, you really think you can get on like the, like Apple help and get a question answered that fast. Like there's no, there's no way in hell that's going to happen. So um, I think Rasmus, that's probably the best way to engage us. I know that um, there's also like the, you know, the help kind of um, email aliases that you can find on Autodesk. Maybe one of our, uh, one of the panelists might have a better answer to you. Uh, or have an email that they can post in the chat or something. But I would say that's the best way to do it. Um, yeah. And some people also have access. It's not available to everybody in the lower right-hand corner. There's chat with an expert. It's not in every time zone yet. It's being rolled out. Cool. So latest question from Stuart Duncan. In the machine database, when I set my machine's work envelope, it transposes Z and X values. So I can't set it or I will get alarms when I try to machine large parts. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? I might need to read that once or twice more. I'm, re I'm looking for it now. Stuart, is the machine database in Fusion or on the machine? This is, this is, we're doing it live, folks. Stuart, if you can answer that part, we'll, we'll, we'll keep responding to you. Or the one, Stuart, just chuck that in the forum, tag me in the manufacturing one at richard.stubbly, and it will send me an email and I'll answer it from there. And it cool. Could can you uh, post the link in the chat of the forum so people have it? Oh, Infusion, okay. Could be the setup, WCS maybe, or... Yeah, maybe. It's, yeah, um, Stuart, we'll take this offline. It'd be much easier to answer on this live chat. So. Cool. So, Stuart, just to recap, post your question and tag Stuart uh, in the forum, and he'll he'll cover he'll cover you on that one. Um, so, yes, strong opinions. Uh, you do have a strong opinion in regards to waste and material. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real, folks. Like the demo stuff that we show is so that you can get an idea of how it works. Your workflow is up to you. There's a lot of questions around, you know, molded molded wood or steam bent wood and, and optimizing that around sustainability. I personally, our business is a fully sustainable business. We actually plant trees after we sell furniture. We actually, every piece of furniture is 10 times more material than we use in each piece. So. You know, I don't think it's the software's, I don't think it's the software's problem to, to be as sustainable and efficient with your material as you want it to be. Um, but I, but to that point, there are already a number of ways that you can optimize your material waste in fusion. It's just going to take a little bit of playing with it. So I wanted to address that because it is a real concern. I mean, we are talking about organic materials. We are talking about, you know, deforestation. We are talking about manufacturing processes and there's no reason for us to shy away from having those harder conversations about material optimization or anything like that because how we impact the world with what we do is also as important as how we impact our workflow to make sure our businesses thrive. Um, on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and give you a little bit of a teaser of what we're gonna talk about tomorrow. So tomorrow it's gonna be um, Brad, myself and... Uh, 
All right, let me share the other one. So there's going to be Brad, myself, and Jonathan. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about drawings. So anybody who's shipping products knows that you have to do a set of construction drawings or assembly drawings or bill of materials, all of that stuff. So tomorrow we're gonna to talk about the drawing space. And we're actually gonna talk about template automation specifically. My pet peeve is having to do drawings every time for each piece, totally independently from what I've already done. And drawing template automation is a perfect opportunity for you to essentially set up a style that you like that works with you and automate most of the process. You'll still have to add dimensions. You'll still have to add some structural or sectional callouts or break views or anything like that. But all of the like quadruple clicks you have to do to place things and align things or multiple sheets or anything like that, we'll cover. We're also gonna cover, I'm gonna do another share out on Fusion Team. One of the most like slept on, let me see, is it all, can you see Fusion Team pulled up? No. Anybody? No, no. not yet. I'm still sitting in drawing. Right. Hold on. Let me, uh, so I showed it at the beginning. Reshare it. So sorry about that. So one of the things that I showed earlier was Brad's uh, wine cabinet. And essentially what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to cover kind of the online portion of what Fusion Team can do for you. And Fusion Team is essentially, you know, it's web-based. You can share things with customers. You can do all kinds of stuff. And let me, uh, there, you should see that. So basically, Fusion Team is an opportunity to get in, see what kind of data you're working with, but then even open it up. And you can even go in, you can open these files onto the desktop, or you can go in and you can add commentary, you can see where it's used in drawings, all kinds of stuff, which is massively helpful when you're talking to customers. You know, I've had moments where I walk up to a new site and they say, hey, what does that look like again? And I pull out my iPad, I pull up Fusion Team and I show it to them and we kind of scroll around and I'll even, they'll even do live commentary. They'll say, hey, you know what? Like after seeing how the space has really come out, we'd love to actually extend this a little bit, which then plays back to that day two for parameters. So I, I hope you're super excited about it. That one will also just have a, a lot more kind of like closing conversation. So I think, you know, take a moment to think about some of the stuff that, that um, think about some of the stuff that you'd like to know, think about some of the things that you'd like clarification on and, and Brad and I and, and Jonathan will do our best to field it. And with that, unless there's any like, I need help right this moment, I think we can end it there. I hope everybody enjoyed learning a little bit more about manufacturing in the furniture industry and special thanks to our guests today. Thanks for taking time out of your day and fielding questions and, and thanks for participating too in the chat. You know, it's really great to see that type of engagement. It's really cool. Um, and I guess one last question uh, about rendering. You know what, Haynes, we're actually gonna do a, an entire rendering session. We've, we've had a lot of questions about rendering. Um, so I'll write your question down, figure out when we can do that and then field it. And if, if I can't get to it fast enough, just post it in the forum and, and we'll, uh, we'll, someone will give you some help there. So unless anybody else on the on the host side has anything to say, I think we can say our goodbyes, say thanks. Cheers, everyone. Really appreciate your time um, joining on the call today. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, everyone. All right, y'all. See y'all later. Everything. Yeah, bye-bye.